you've reached the Signal Watch. Movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine cultural artifacts of the 20th century, boldly explore the 21st, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. Hey everybody and welcome back to the signal watch as always i'm your host ryan steens and with me today is uh mike subzak welcome back man uh thanks good to be here um looking forward to the discussion if uh if you have not heard mike's prior episode uh i don't know if it's going to be a hundred percent required that you go back and do it but i would recommend it uh because we covered the raid the uh the raid redemption or the first raid movie uh, in that episode. So do go look for it. Um, but we are here to talk about what today? Uh, we're talking about the sequel, uh, The Raid 2. And uh, I'm glad to have you as a guide because uh, with both The Raid Redemption and The Raid 2, uh, I personally could easily slide into like my own rendition of the Chris Farley show and just go, you know, remember that time when Rama fought all those guys inside the car? You know, that that was awesome you know i just i could do that for pretty much every scene in both movies so i think having some good uh guidance on a walkthrough of the of the high points of the movie is going to be going to be good i could just trail off forever on on both of the films <laughs> um i mean but i understand why you feel that way i i everyone had told me to watch the sequel you know definitely watch the raid then watch the sequel and but what everyone told me was a little bit of a lie which was well, it picks up right after the first one, which is technically true. And then it jumps like two years. It's like, mm, it, yeah. there's like five minutes at the beginning that they're like, okay, here's what happens immediately after. And then now, now two years later. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, well, th- that was, it was sold on something that was not true. Um, <laughs> in the yeah, like a half truth at best. Yeah, it, uh, it, you know, it was fine. I adjusted. I'm, I, you know, I can, I'm able to pivot. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting too, because the film is not at all structured like the first one. Like they did not say, let's go back to the well. That worked really well. Let's just do it again. Um, mm-hmm. it's a completely different kind of movie, uh, with a lot more character depth and, uh, a lot more stuff going on. I, I think in this film, it's not just a showcase for look at what we can do. Um, yeah, it, it. I mean, it still is. It just look at all of the things we can do in this one. Right. I think they got. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, they got about four times the budget they had from the first, and I think it it does show up a bit in uh, the cinematography they're able to do. Um, I think is particularly from you know not just the opening shot, but I think that the the first shot of the film is, I think, almost like a a marker or a signal to show you, Hey, this is not going to be the same scope, that same tight confined, uh, you know, visibility that we had in the first rate where everything was like cramped hallways and just, you know, one, you know, one apartment complex. And, uh, you know, you, that, that first shot being, uh, this wide open grassy green field, it's, it's a little overcast, but, you know, but compared to the first film, you're already seeing more colors than you, you basically did the entire run of the, of the first, the raid redemption. Um, yeah, and it's shot in this big, huge, wide scope where, like, all the action is taking place in a very small section of the screen where they're, you know, basically driving uh, Andy out to his unfortunate demise. Um, but it yeah, just kind of gets the ball rolling from there. But, yeah, you're you're correct in that it, it does – it is a more sprawling film. I think, like, you know, I don't know if I described it as, like, you know, Rama goes internal affairs or he's basically kind of, you know, the next logical step of, okay, you took down this – small time bad guy you've got a taste of there's a deeper rot and 
you know, he finds his way to the people who help him, you know, become part of, uh, you know, finding justice and, you know, rooting out the, the true higher level bad guys. Um, and of course I just, in the, the two year jump that you mentioned, yeah, it, it sort of comes about, I think it comes about maybe 15 minutes into the film, but yeah, it's, it's sort of a, we'll kind of come back to that, that point on the topics, but uh, yeah, definitely like shows you that they're going to take their time. It's not, it's not a real time movie like uh, the Raid Redemption was more or less. Yeah. Um, this one felt to me like, and I, my understanding is Gareth Edward Evans, sorry, Gareth Edwards, mm-hmm. Gareth Evans has gone on to go and direct um, kind of gangster or mobster stuff in, uh, in the UK, uh, in Scotland. Um, and that tracks much more closely after watching this than having had seen the raid. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen the first season of it's uh, gangs of London. Uh, it's, yeah. it's and it definitely, it has that kind of, it's, it's a bit of a pulpy crime drama, um, but still, it still has that the signature Gareth Evans fight choreography and just action set pieces, just, you know, with non-Indonesian people this time around for the most part. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's definitely got his style. And I think friends of mine, who are familiar with the raid go, Oh yeah, I saw the show. Like I, I was wondering who it was and I wasn't surprised to see that it was Gareth Evans was the director. So it was, yeah. um, I think there's a season two out there now that I have yet to catch up on, but it's, it's in my queue. Yeah. It's um, so just to do a quick uh, plot synopsis, we'll try and keep this <laughs> as tight as possible <laughs> because like with most gangster epics, you could spend 20 minutes just doing that. Um, the, our hero Rama, um, agrees to go to prison essentially uh to get close to the son of one of the head mafiosos um i don't know what you call it i know in japan it's like the yakuza um but i have no idea anywhere else what you um so he he does do that he managed to manages it with while he's in prison to ingratiate himself to this guy uko um and who is a if we're going to use uh, archetypes, he's a bit of a Fredo. Um, he's he he wants to be a big time gangster, but his father uh, is not allowing him to uh, necessarily take the reins the way that he feels he's ready for. Um, and there are other players. You start finding out that like the Japanese are involved in in like uh land disputes and and like literally like land disputes and um then there's another third player uh who's who's trying to also uh come up through the ranks who decides that he wants to get involved um and so basically it becomes a bit of a what's the word i'm looking for red harvest or uh, you know any any of the like yojimbo or there's multiple factions kind of fighting and there's a guy kind of caught in the middle of all of these uh crime factions um and that's our our hero rama who of course has to uh fist fight his way out of many scenarios and that's why you pay the big bucks to watch it yeah. um, but uh yeah i mean as far as as a gangster drama goes i thought that was the part that genuinely surprised me like i it was really tightly written um they kind of mentioned all of this stuff was happening in the raid that like oh you don't know there's wheels within wheels there's all the you know these layers Mm -hmm. of corruption and you do get to start to see all of that or you do see pieces of all of that through this film of who these big time players are like he was inserted at the right place to talk to the right guy to to get up close um so yeah, it's a it's a interesting movie um, from from just a gangster perspective. I'll forget all the martial arts and the amazing action in it. Um, once again, uh, he leaves his poor wife yeah. uh, behind. The, this time for years at a time as he as he yeah and, and running much away. more time than I'm sure he expected. Yeah, was, yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you that you picked up and appreciate on the the basically the mafioso drama part of it i think that's i think it's something that the expanded budget could help because i mean um 
the the way they're able to shoot, you know, like the locations where the senior, you know, the the mafia leaders, the, the Indonesian mafia leader and the Japanese mafia leader, the both of those guys, I thought were for one well casted. They really kind of just exhibited the the gravitas of that kind of level of like I've been around for a while and I've kind of gotten used to how the way things are and I've sort of moved into this phase where I kind of value stability and peace over me trying to like puff up and make, you know, make myself seem like a big shot, like, like, uh, uh, Bangun's son Uko is, is doing in the film. Uh, you know, that plus they've, you know, got, got a nice, uh, wardrobe budget. All the guys look really sharp. You know, everyone's you know, all the guys who are supposed to be well-dressed or well-dressed. The offices look, you know, fantastic. So, I mean, the, the fact that they were able to roll that, you know, film this part of the story with, with an expanded amount of money to work with was, was a nice touch. I think that helped kind of sell the, just the establishment of, of, you know, uh, you know, how professional, I guess they were, you kind of tell it in, in their, the communication, the, the meetings between the two, you know, rival leaders, even though they are kind of technically rivals, they kind of have this, this kind of grudging understanding of, you know, kind of a professional relationship. So it's sort of like nothing's, you know, everything at the top level is, is all business, you know, no, no emotion. So I think, and there's several scenes that bounce through uh, in the movie where they kind of, those senior level, the old gray hairs are able to kind of talk things out and it's, you know, kind of offers a little different uh, perspective or different, uh, different pace of scene versus all the rest of the really hectic chaotic action. That's, you know, the main driver. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I, a while back we covered, uh, I hate to compare the films, but uh, the, the movie Electra, which was based on a comic book, it came out in like 2003 or so. Oh yeah. Yep. And they, they tried Never saw that. Did you, you know, well, you're, no, because I saw never, Daredevil, I was like, I'm not really signed up for any of the rest of this. Well, I managed to avoid yeah. it till I was talked into it for the podcast. <laughs> so, um, but I, 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 don't, I do not recommend. Um, I mean, unless you really are in the mood for something that is not good, but they try and do like, we're the mafia plus like there's ninjas because Marvel and they're, they're, idea of what the boardroom stuff is like you need the banality that kind of that boardroom is and why uko is kind of slamming up against it and he he thinks we're not taking action and it's like not taking action is the action and he's not getting that versus the completely batshit stuff in electra it is not in a good way usually i like batshit but (laughs) in electra it's much more of like here come our three burly supervillains who will come through to, you know, pose for us for 20 seconds. So you know who to look for in the next scene. Um, All very paper thin. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, but yeah, I think that the guy who particularly who played Bangoon, um, you're you're right. Absolutely. uh, Nailed it as kind of the, technically he's a mob boss, but even he kind of has the balance of power. Um, He's, you know, trapped a bit by it. Um, he knows he can't make any sudden moves sort of thing. Can't just do whatever he wants. Um, and it seems like he, there's a lot more going on with Reza, uh, the, the, the corrupt cop in this. Yeah. Um, then I was initially really pinging to when I started watching the film. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I think, uh, for the most part, It's it's kind of sells with for Ben Goon, like just how just like I said, he's a bad guy. But the fact that by the end of spoiler, he gets you know betrayed and shot by his own son, uh, you know, you, just, you kind of feel for him. It just sort of feels like he got got done wrong a bit. You know, he's like he was really long term interested looking after his son, but he just he was just too hot headed and like he could kind of see his own son's limitations on how he wasn't ready to take a leadership role. And you know, Trump was basically saying, well, this is the best thing I can do for him is to keep him out of the action and. He didn't realize it was going to, his son was a uh, patricidal. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, I can't, I was trying to think after it was shocking when that scene happened, I, I'm mm-hmm. used to seeing the, you know, young buck railing against the older mobster and other things. Um, and I thought it was being well done, but it's kind of a matter of like, how well are you doing it versus like, is this actually novel? And yeah. Um, then he pulls out his gun and actually shoots his father in the head. I was like, I literally don't think I've ever seen, I've seen the thing where like the Fredo thing where, you know, they screw something up and and now dad gets killed or injured because of your, your bad behavior. 
Uh, but they always do the thing of like, well, I didn't intend for that to be the consequence. But of course, irony, you know, dramatic irony means it must happen. And in this, yeah. the dude just straight out pulls out a revolver and shoots his dad in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, think he really I think he immediately feel. I think he immediately feel. You know, he, the actor there, Uko, immediately shows he feels the weight of it right away. Like he's, you know, it's definitely takes its toll on him. But like, you know, he sort of. I think he sort of by that point in the movie, he sort of backed himself into like, you know, I'm already. I'm already, I'm already going to work myself up to like, you know, this things have to change and I'm never going to get my shot. And, you know, uh, they got the, the up, up and comer Bejo talking in his ear. So it was just sort of, it was a matter of time before he kind of got led down that road, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you, you know, you just know why this dude was never going to get that shot, you know, just from how, how the relationship works between he and he and that and Bezo. Um, but, uh, a lot of stuff happens in addition to all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we even got into the fighting part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it. I mean, it 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 takes a minute to get going, uh, and then it has this sequence where Rama is in a stall in a in a men's room in the prison, and it's just amazingly shot. Everyone's in their prison like duds everyone's got a shaved head and it's just bodies coming at him. It's, it's a, it's yeah. a reflection of the prior movie in its own way. It's, um, it's, it's uh, that particular, that scene in particular is, is um, it's one of what the first, of what I call like a moment of focus where basically the, the way Gareth shoots that scene, it, you know, it's like, it starts in tight on Brahma being in that, in that stall and he's in everything around him is just kind of like the sounds purposely muffled. He's just kind of, sitting there quietly, just not even really concerned about the fact that there's this, you know, what seemed, seemed like dozens of guys outside the bathroom stall just banging on the door trying to get at him because, you know, they, they're trying to, whatever, just teach him a lesson or introduce themselves or who knows. And all, like I said, the, the sound's drained out. His vision is hyper-focused on this one, you know, screw on the stall door that's slowly getting, like, rattled loose from the force of all the guys banging on it. And it's just, you know, and to the extent where it finally culminates in, you know, that one screw drops you know hits the floor like a pin ping and then also boom the door opens and then it's just this big chaotic burst of, of violence which is you know well it's not i would i was gonna say it's your introduction to the film's action but really i guess that that happened about five ten minutes before with uh andy out in the field because he gets the uh shotgun kiss to the cheek you know it's that one with cut to the splash screen of the raid too which kind of shows you that that showed you right away this the movie's gonna be just as kinetic and and, and uh, frantic, but then the bathroom stall fight continues it on pretty quickly afterwards, and, and just kind of goes on. And he's just fighting, like you say, he's fighting wave after wave of guys, and just you know busting out his uh, penchocks a lot. You know, that you're gonna see for you know a good a good long time afterwards because the movie is quite longer than it's about a good hour longer than the first film. Yeah, it's a it's a healthy runtime to fit in all the story that they want to do, um, but never because of the kineticism of the film not for two seconds do you feel like oh this is starting to drag man <laughs> like that just does not happen yes yeah i mean I, I i i i i always feel like my opinion is not credible on that because i like the film so much but yeah you know, i always have felt like it's as far as a long movie goes it, there's not these long downbeats where you're like i'm going okay let's move on to the next thing they're always kind of bringing every scene seems to have a good purpose on kind of kicking that ball forward and saying okay here's the next next wheels in motion, you know, setting the next chain of events up. Yeah. It's, it's, a uh, um, they kind of go right from that bathroom scene into, uh, now he's in the prison yard and how does he make his alliance with, um, the, the Uko, the, the mm -hmm. mob son. And that is a, really well, he gets that meeting in the mess hall where like Uko kind of like shows his status by walking up with the, the shiv and, plain sight he's just like you know kind of menacing him going you know basically him recognizing rama's a formidable you know either opponent or ally and uh, even though he kind of just you know trashed a bunch of his hired protectors you know he still wants to kind of maybe get him in the fold yeah 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 absolutely um and so yeah they start doing that kind of that really but he's like no 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 he's you know plays it cool in that moment mm -hmm. if, he's, if he's gonna leap at Quite it, hard to get yeah <laughs> yeah um, and then once he 
but yeah then they get into the yard fight and um that is another amazingly shot sequence uh and and kind of gives you the level of brutality this one's going to have somewhat from the budget and and uh the number of people but also some creative things that they're going to be able to do um pouring down rain and <laughs> it turns into a a gang fight in the middle of this mud pit and and all these yeah, prisoners and pl- and police alike yeah just yeah i mean what i love about that scene is like it's you know it's um again like you said it's 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 beautifully shot it's like you know the the you can just from the very start you know you got this white noise of the rain coming down you can see these this is like their yard time where they're supposed to get all the energy out but they're all stuck underneath these these kind of covered pavilions because there's just a big mud pit out there and you know the, this music starts slowly like kind of building and building it basically just that's the scene before the fight starts is kind of just cranks on to like 11 where you're just like the, 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 the wine, the music's winding up. You see the gut, you kind of see that Rama knows that something's going down. He can see people, you know, kind of giving hand signals and knows that something's about to happen. And then the guys like make their way across those like three guys, I think, including Benny, who's Uko's right hand, you know, kind of bodyguard, I think at that point. They're kind of walking across. It's like this beautiful slow motion, like the rain's just dripping down. It's just you can just kind of tell. Then they sort of unwind some slow motion into fast motion as they approach him. And that's Rama kind of just, you know, that's another one of his moments of slow focus where he's just kind of like twisting that broom handle saying, okay, I know I'm about to have to get into a fight, so I'm going to get myself a weapon. And he just kind of just takes his moment and, and then, you know, right at the right moment, everything just pops off and it's a good another, what, 10-minute fight of just complete, absolute mayhem. Um Including one of the the other, you know, what I think Gareth Evan had referred to as uh, the punchline moments of his scenes, where he kind of like, you know, you have like the, obviously there's action and fights and just just violence throughout the movie, but then there's always these these key specific moments that I think he sets up that like it's like an especially brutal hit or finish or something that like they show it fast and they cut away and that and this scene it's the one where the um, the guy is this an assassination attempt on Uko and this guy is kind of has like a knife and he was on his knees, tries to jump forward to kind of just stab at Uko and Rama's at his side, just kind of just kicks the guy and all of a sudden his cheek goes straight into that concrete bench. And it's just sort of like real quick, you know, it's like, as soon as you see it, you know, you have just enough time for the whole audience to go, Oh my God. And then it's like, and boom, you know, it's gone. You don't see it anymore. It's like, I think that's kind of his mastery is to be able to kind of like show that level of kind of like, Oh, like, Oh shit level of violence with, you know, boom, the quick cut, don't linger on it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting... Um, so one of the things I don't like in horror films is, like, I, I just don't care about the gore. Um, in, in some of... In, if that's your jam, go for it, enjoy, no, no judgment. I don't particularly like it. It works way better for me if I'm watching something like The Thing and... You know, you of course know that, oh my God, there's this thing. But half the time, all you have to see is someone walk into a room, right? And you're yeah. like, oh man, like the horror of imagining, you know, is is worse. I do like how he brings the, the violence because these are martial arts films, like right to the edge. But you don't, you do see a few times where someone's head pops, but, but he doesn't rely on it. And often when that happens, yeah. it's like as the camera's moving or, you know, whatever, he, he never lingers on it. Um, yeah, so you, it's more theater of the mind. Yeah, it's just it's the here's the here's the vibe of what was happening, but it's not. We're not going to just yeah, just we're not going to saw or hostile this and just sort of like go let the camera just hover. It's going to move. It's going to move on. But the the scene's interesting to me too because it's um it's the it's the story in microcosm, right? It's like everybody's weaponized everybody's pretending like nothing's going on it's obviously shitty everybody's kind of waiting to do something Mm -hmm. Um, and the cops in this or the law enforcement through the i don't know if you call prison guards cops but we for the purposes of this argument we will yeah uh but you know it's this three-way fight where the cops are in there and they're a problem but those guys are really focused on going at each other uh, mm-hmm. And they're again, some of them will get taken out by the cops. And that's kind of the story in its way with Rama inserting himself into it. Um, it and being one of you know the badass who's kind of making sure things rattle out, you know, correctly. Yeah. Um, 
I, and I, I had that passing thought at some point in the movie because then they're all covered in mud and you can't tell who's who. And I was like, ah, Gareth Evans, symbolism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Well noted. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I've, I've got thoughts about uh, Uko and Benny and Rama uh, for later on whenever Dejo gets involved, uh, I want to cover. But yeah, it's just because that's one of the things I, I kind of puzzled out through the through the the film was that you know okay this was the guy who was basically supposed to be Uko's you know protector and all of a sudden he's he's going after him and then uh there's well you know, I'm gonna table it for later but yeah there's oh, no, go for it go for it there's no rules man all right, all right. uh well because I guess there, there's a later later part of the film where again so Benny is part of the guys who basically betray Uko and try to assassinate him in that prison riot and then later on in the film uh when Uko and Rama get out of jail. Uh, Bejo, the up and comer, he basically is, arranges a meeting with Uko to kind of say, "Hey, you know, look, um, I, all, all I want is a little bit of help. You know, I, you know, let's, you know, I know your dad's big and powerful. Let's kind of talk about, you know, the state of, you know, mafia affairs in in uh, Jakarta, I guess they're in." Um, and at that time, Bejo, who kind of like takes Uko to dinner in this little restaurant, I guess that he owns brings in all these guys, you know, Benny among them, uh, you know, in, in much a very similar uh, scene as in the first, in the first raid movie where, um, where the head gang boss basically kind of takes five guys and sort of, you know, executes them uh, in his office. Same thing. Bejo brings in these guys and says, look, you know, I heard those guys, t- these guys try to take you out. I'm surprised that your dad didn't send anybody to get them when they got out of prison, but I went and picked them up for you. Kind of like a, like a peace offering or, or, or kind of like a gift, you know, like, Hey, look, I got you. These guys tried to kill you. You know, you, here's a, here's a scalpel. If you want to kind of, you know, take a look at them up close. So, uh, Uko does eventually basically kill them all. But my one question that I would have asked Gareth Evans is I couldn't tell even when, whenever they walked up there, Uko's walking up there and Bejo to Benny and all the rest of them. He's basically killed everybody, but Benny, he's kind of holding Benny up and Benny even gets a good look at Bejo. And I'm just like, you know, it it was it becomes obvious later from shared tattoos that they had on on their wrists or something on necks that Benny was part of Bejo's gang and he must have been inserted into the prison. Am I? And I was like, why didn't Benny like you know say something to Uko just to, you know kind of go, hey, this guy sent me to kill you or something? Yeah, you know, I, I was like, why why is he not saying anything right now? He just kind of like accepts his death with pretty grim, you know resolve i guess and my, my only thought was maybe the guy's a mute because they never did hear him talk but like you know um that's the only thing i could come up with because otherwise or, or maybe he's just like ah, it doesn't matter anyways even if i said it you wouldn't believe me or you you know either way i'd be dead so you know just forget it but that's, that's but maybe, what i was thinking is is yeah. you know you got what's coming to you he, he's gonna turn on you just as he's turned on like being being hooked up with Bejo is is bad news. Um, yeah, it basically demonstrated zero loyalty, huh? Yeah, yeah. 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 But I guess my and I, then I thought like you know how did it must have been the plan first that Bejo was going to insert Benny in there, get Uko killed, pin it on the Japanese somehow, and then start start the uh, gang war that he wanted, you know, to create the power vacuum that the Bejo could use to kind of rise up through the ranks. And then when Rama got involved and kind of foiled that, then it became this was the backup plan to sort of like you know curry the the favor of uh, Bangun's son, you know. Yeah, it's, it's Plan B. Yeah, I mean it's it's a fairly complicated film, and and like a lot of gangster films where there's you know all this stuff going on, you do have to kind of read between the lines as to what everybody wants. Um, and and what they're doing in that moment because everyone in a crime film is potentially unreliable and and a a liar and so um it does make for some really interesting stuff we 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 paused the movie i don't remember exactly when um but my wife turned to me and (laughs) was like it was after uh bejo had shown up and was like now what what does he want (laughs) and i was like i'm not that's that's fair but i think he wants literally physically land and which i imagine is fairly scarce in indonesia to to go just go claim for good 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 land um 
and it, it sounds like the only way he's going to be able to do it is through nefarious means. And this is this is how he's planning to do it. He's got to start a gang war in order to clear the the table for himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it uh, it it's it it does get very like, and that's why you, when you have a, like Bangoon, the father who's um, trying to keep everything above board, it's like we might we might be doing illegal stuff and and running drugs and hookers, but we can at least all be agree that that's what we're doing, right? Right? Yeah, it's it's a it's a yeah, right? It's a balance. It's a it's yeah. a you know ungentlemanly agreement. Like yeah, we're, let's this is good. Everything's working fine. Let's not you know just yeah. you know rock the boat, so to yeah. speak exactly what Beja wants to do um yeah uh you know at this point of the film we were talking about you know he's eventually rama and uko get out of prison go meet you know uko's dad bangun and has the uh kind of very very intimate get to know you meeting in his office which yeah. uh you know <laughs> the complete strip search of like you know hey it's not that i don't trust you i just don't trust anybody kind of you know meeting uh where rama has to kind of just completely you know strip naked so he can see these not wearing a wire which of course he was wearing a wire from the clothes that uh his uh his uh buddy i don't know i can't remember the guy's name right now um the the good man in the um yeah the one in the, good in police force yeah it was uh what's it his name bunawar thank you yeah it was bunawar giving him which he's not too happy about later but uh i always laughed at that scene because the last part of that scene you know, the, the Van Gogh's office is kind of like this, you know, it's very nicely appointed and it's got a, a just a glass wall between him and the receptionist's office. So like, you know, who, who showed them in earlier. So it's just kind of like laughing, like how many times has, has the receptionist at that desk seen, you know, this kind of introduction or, you know, or interview, you know, I guess interview with Van Gogh, you know, probably time and time again, like zero trust, you know. <laughs> I did have a, a thought of after Van Gogh had been shot and, um Bejo and his gang showed up mm -hmm. of what kind of like there's no way this woman's being paid enough to sit at this desk for whatever yeah. job she's got. <laughs> um she's either has some deep loyalty or something, but yeah, it, it, it was it almost got to be comical, like, oh my god, this poor woman and everything mm -hmm. she just in the duration of this film. <laughs> I think she might have the uh, clerk's uh, contractors on the Death Star argument. Like she you knows, she knew what she was getting into. Like you know, <laughs> no yeah. sympathy. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, and the uh, uh, you know after that point when they basically deliver, you know, uh, Aka, who's like uh, kind of like Bangun's consigliere, so sort of, sort of, you know, sort of like a man on the ground, who sort of keeps everything in check, and uh, I think he probably looks after Uko as well. I think a little bit before Rama. Um, Ika takes Rama to like his apartment that like he's getting put up with, which is super nice. I mean, it's, it, you know, again, when you, whenever I do like the watch parties, that's always like a crowd pleaser. It's people like, Oh man, nice, nice apartment. It's like, you know, super modern, clean aesthetic. Um, you know, it's like, guess not, not a bad reward for all the work he put in, which I, we can, we kind of gloss over again, but yeah, he was, Rama was stuck in the prison for two full years. You know, that's just, and then they just kind of put it up as like a, a nice little uh, screen when Rama gets out of prison where they just got this overhead shot of him looking really, really small in this huge font, like two years later, it's just like hits you in the face. Like, yeah, he, you know, he was really in it. You know, he, you know, that's, you know, two years in prison is not leisure time, you know, it, and it's also time that's, you know, he lost from his family. His young son is, you know, grown a couple of years and he'll never get back. You know, it's just, there's just so much loss and un unexpected loss too. It's just unrecoverable. That's he's having to, to deal with, uh, which is why the scene where, he basically kind of like says goodbye to Ika and then he like, you know, puts on the loud music. You don't really know what's going on at first. He's just kind of like, it's just deafening, you know, drum club music. And then he you know, takes out a, takes out a phone, takes out the SIM card. I guess he's, I don't know how long he's been hiding the SIM card in his, in his cheek or his gums or whatever, but pulls that out, you know, makes his phone untraceable, I guess, to the, to the mafiosos and then calls Bruno War first to kind of chew him out for almost getting him killed with the wire. And then after that, it's kind of, like, I think the second, um, moment of focus, uh, as I would call it, of he's kind of just plugs his ears. All of a sudden, the, the the music, the loud music, drowns out again. He's just kind of closes his eyes. It's just all he's focusing on is he's calling his his wife to kind of just say, "Hey, you know, it's it's been two years. So I'm you know I'm okay. Sorry, you know, um, you know things just kind of went sideways." And then he gets to gets that moment to just you know she kind of 
says, you know, hey, your son's playing in the other room and do you want to talk to him? He's like, no, just let me hear him. So she kind of holds up the phone and just, you know, music kind of kicks in. You just kind of hear that. You just kind of hear that of all the, you know, violence and, and, you know, chaos we've seen in the, you know, preceding 30, 45 minutes, whatever. This is just, you know, child's innocent peals of laughter. It's just like, it really kind of just shines through pretty brightly. And I think that, I think it does a really good job with not a lot of screen time, just kind of selling like, this is the magnitude of what he's had to kind of go through. And I think other action films either don't address that or they just kind of like sort of, you know, it's like a, again, not to kind of pound on Michael Bay, even though he's a favorite target of mine, it's just like, you know, in his hands, that kind of movie would be like, you know, it'd be the U S soldier going, I got to go save my country. And the wife would just go, you go do you honey. You know, it's like, we're proud of you. And, you know, it's it'd just be like, so, wrong. That, that's absolutely, yeah, it'd, be, it'd be so, it'd be so weightless. Right. So that's, that's why I kind of appreciate that this, it's such a, such a violent and dark movie in places can have that still, it still brings back that heart. So, you know, there is a reason why he's fighting because there is good and, you know, kind of there's love in the world and all the rest of it. Um, I just, I just, I just appreciate scenes like that because it kind of helps to, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't like, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't drag. It just sort of, it, it's there, it's, it's placed in it and it's effective. Yeah. It, it, there's, there's also this interesting bit of it, of that, the, um, I'm turning my face away from the mic as I'm thinking that probably wasn't great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, of uh, the cops, while they have good intentions, one, they left him to rot in prison for two years and, and mm-hmm. apparently did nothing, hoping that that would be helpful. And then they, um, they're they basically like, yeah, we're not pulling you out no matter what. Like You have to basically finish this or you die within the organization or you're, you know, we're... we're yeah we'd love to want to help you but we're <laughs> we're not gonna want we're not going to uh yeah. or you know just, like we're on the we're on the good side but you know we do still have we're gonna you know limit our exposure so to speak or you know yeah which you know reza who it doesn't really make an appearance until later in the film um is apparently some sort of high law enforcement official and um clearly while he's not running anything, everyone kind of has to pay tribute to him in order to operate. Um, and so you can only imagine like if Rama just heads back to the precinct and says, yo, I'm back. He's going to be probably be dead with him yeah. and his whole family. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, you know, one of the big threats that's held up, but really I think the, it's really the, um, you know, love of family. And that's kind of the, the, the yin and yang of that is the, uh, storyline that you briefly see. I, and, uh, Ryan, uh, the actor who was in the, the prior film, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, apparently yeah, just dog. let himself go fa- facial hair wise between films. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, they- that's interesting. See, that's an interesting character pairing him and his wife, uh, kind of wondered about that you know um uh sorry i didn't mean to interrupt your thought there uh, but yeah it, it it he he's doing he was doing what he was doing he was not a law enforcement guy uh but everything he was doing was for providing for his very good looking wife yeah you <laughs> see way out of his league but you got yes the he yeah. had been good looking at one point but killing people yeah. they took its toll yeah, yeah, and he's he's doing it to pay the bills for their child, um, mm-hmm. and so he's kind of giving up on himself. But he's like, okay, I can still, you know, you've kind of turned back at me, but I'll, I'll, I can, I've sort of become this. I can't unbecome it now, and I'll just kind of keep doing what I'm doing to kind of, you know, keep you and, and our child, you know, uh, well suited. Yeah, so, um, it yeah. Is- it was it was like he was definitely she was way ahead of his league for sure. It's like yeah, you must, you must clean up nice or something when you you know when you're not looking shabby in an overgrown coat and you know. A year long beard. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was uh, a really, I, I, there was a movie 25 years ago called The Crossing Guard. And um, there's this, it, it, it's not really comparable, but uh, except for Angelica Houston and Jack Nicholson are, are catching up as some people who lost a child and, and they're mm-hmm. like in a diner talking. And those, I love those scenes in movies. Like those, yeah. those like, we only see each other under certain circumstances. Both people want completely different things out of the interaction. Um, and that's kind of the weird thing about this movie after the raid is it's full of like 
all of this really these really good character beats and moments and then but it's seamless then with this dude just going out and whipping ass in the next yeah. scene yep yeah he's, yeah he's yeah he's mission focused i mean that, that was um that he yeah he, he he was introduced earlier moments earlier in this uh scene which i think is also uh in the color palette style that Gareth Evans was able to use uh, Bangun, like kind of, it just shows this very artful shot of Bangun sitting in this deep red tea room, just kind of just, you know, looking very posh and just kind of, you know, sitting back GQ style. And uh, the character Procoso comes in, serves him some tea. They kind of, you know, have a little quick exchange of money. He's like, okay, here, you got a job to go do. Um, or I guess that happens right after the the diner scene with his wife. Um, cause he's, cause he gets the pager. <laughs> I think he's carrying around a pager, I believe <laughs> a good old school yeah. tech. He's like, yeah, I gotta go. I got some, got some business. And she's like, yeah, you know, okay, you go do what you gotta do. Uh, but yeah, you're right. He, you know, when he just goes straight from that, you know, look, you know, talking to his wife and about, you know, their daughter, and I, I think, you know, it's like, okay, now I gotta go find this one dude and and take him out, and which he does with clinical efficiency. And that scene where he goes after the guys, like, you know, every single person, he's he's carrying a machete with him, but like every single guy that comes at him, he basically just does a quick disable, like, you know barely you know punches him out he's just kind of like just quick like oh nope you're not my target you're down and then goes you know it goes michael myers Meyer style after the the actual dude who you know uh in, in classic fashion cowardly throws his girlfriend at the guy you know <laughs> it's a last ditch effort to you know get away that was that's almost comical yeah it's in talking about the color palette in this i haven't thought i thought about it for about half of a, a second when I was watching the film, because there really are, and I don't want to read too much into it, but the, the, yeah, the no, I don't, the, I didn't draw big themes out of it, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's very specific uses of red, which I don't know in Indonesia if red has any specific connotation. Um, but I did find it interesting. Like Bangun's office is like all white. Uh, yeah. He dresses in, in lighter colors. But he does have a big red painting behind him, like a bull, and that's I, I don't see that. That's got to be a big, you know, power play kind of you know imagery. Mm-hmm. I, I, it seems like. Um, um, and and the whole restaurant that Beja owns is mm-hmm. like it looks like the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover. It's like it's red. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, super red. Yeah. Um, and he, I can't remember. I think he wears black. But the the place where um, Uko and and um, Percoso go for drinks where he sets up Percoso. Yeah. Is black. Yeah. Yeah. It's, super black. It's a little bit of like kind of white neon lighting, but yeah, it's just a definite dark, dark club. Yeah. Um, and, there's this. I mean, it's, it's as much mood. If he was, if he was trying to do some symbolism there, I'm sure if I was a film two student, I could write something, you know, to, to justify all of it. But yeah. just from like mood building, like it, it works incredibly freaking well. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a good key scene too with or just at least a standout scene with when um Uko and uh Rama go to the karaoke bar where he kind of like just sort of menaces some of the, the girls there who don't you know respect his rep or whatever. And it's like he goes into a hallway and it's like this emerald deep green. It's just like it's just startlingly green com- compared to some other you know scenes around it. It's just like I mean, yeah, you know, I don't know if that was like jealousy or insecurity or you know who knows what or if he's trying to go for a, a color symbolism but you know it definitely stood out at least visually yeah in that respect yeah it was and that that seems really good too the um the dynamic of how uko is when he thinks he's not getting his due you you see some mm-hmm. of like what what will build later but you know oh my god how how could it be that this karaoke girl you know, hostess how dare she yeah. uh, you know it was was i mean it's a startling scene because it's really the first time i think you see uko break the like i'm a suave dude character mm-hmm. yeah it's like i'll just be yeah I, you know if you don't respect me, i'm just going to go straight to the thug and just you know be completely you know, you know misogynistic and, and cruel just you know. he was coming off of this this thing of um i mean essentially like, he's the he's the head boss's son but he's doing like i said the, the main action scene that was right before that was them heading to the uh the you know porno den multimedia center you know with a little sprightly you know short guy you know running the whole operation um which that incidentally amongst all the things this film has to offer when i actually show my kids this movie in a, a number of years from now that's be the one scene i'll probably have to like skip forward a few frames just to kind of you know spare us all the 
mutual dying inside of being in the same room together because <laughs> And, and I was when I when I did um, show this movie to a large audience at my, at my company, I was up front. I was like, "Look, there's going to be a work conversation between you know, a, you know, a business owner and his employee about midway through this movie. Um, we'll all get through it. We're all adults. You know, it's like, but it's also one of long. the best laughs in the film. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I that yeah, the action in that sequence is really good. The the only reason I would take umbrage with it um was it was a reminder that you can get guns in this world. Yeah. Um and they just don't sometimes. They find yeah, sometimes they just don't have Yeah. Um but yeah, the little guy particular had like almost the biggest pistol. I think he was about as big as he was, which was <laughs> I mean, like he, you know, he used it quickly into some good effect, but yeah, and it was, and that, that same, that scene too, just kind of build that same tension where you just go, you could just by the conversation, you know, like the, Hey, look, you know, we know you're doing stuff on the side and, you know, you know, yeah, sure. You gave us some money, but it's not enough. There's just the tension is just sort of like, you know, you can just tell it's either going to like dissipate with some extra cash on the table or it's going to like explode. And you kind of just start picking up where the, you know, where it's going to start going wrong and it goes wrong pretty yeah. fast. Yeah, but uh, credit to the little guy's um, safe opening skills. Like he was on point. Like he just took a dive towards that safe where he knew the big gun was, and he was like, you know, within like three clicks, he was he was ready to go. So he must have been practicing for that uh, that to happen. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just it, explodes it, in gunfire. Yeah, he, uh, that he he's scrappy. I thought that guy. Mm-hmm. I liked him. Yeah, he was he was not he was not giving up till the bitter end. Yeah. Um, and some fantastic uh, camera work there by uh, by Gareth. You know, with the little guy's escape, where if you just kind of remember, he's kind of he's there's a long table in, in the room, and he decides to make a break for it by running on the table and jumping to his left through a window, which the camera also follows him through that you know or through another you know point along the way. He lands in the next hallway, and they just sort of like it's just that kind of kinetic chaos that just the camera is able to keep up and they could move again. I think I kind of mentioned in the first podcast, how they, I'm sure they brought it over. They had the, these camera rigs, which were basically like steering wheels attached to the cameras where they could, you know, with a quick twist, you know, rotate the camera, move it around, or just had a greater amount of uh, mobility, I think for the, for the camera operators to, to use. And so like, you know, the same like moments later when Rama's chasing after that little guy, like uh, Rama basically, slams and throws him through another window into another room and and basically the he gets thrown over the camera who's on the ground and he gets thrown into the room and then like you know as the guy gets on his feet the camera turns around and pops up to follow him so it's just like this is a very you know very very active camera which is uh you know i, I definitely appreciate that yeah yeah no it was it was that that scene was handled a little differently from the others it was probably the closest to the first film uh yeah. of the of the scenes i mean we haven't even started talking about the car chase, which is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got notes on that for sure. Yeah. Oh. That's a whole nother level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the, the work both within the cars, I'm not exactly sure how they did some of that. Um, I certainly I can tell you at least I can tell you at least one point. Yeah, well, yeah, I can tell you at least Go one for point. it, please. Okay, right. okay, right. yeah. So um, no, the, the car chase, I think probably one of the moments you might be talking about is um I mean there's a whole lot into that whole scene. Um but there's one camera point where Ika is driving up with the car and the camera is kind of like moving back to meet him and it actually goes through the passenger window yep. to join him, and then it continues on from there. Basically, and the key to that was the passenger uh, passenger seat in that car was actually a guy camouflaged as, as the seat. And they said, basically, so they basically drove up with the camera on another vehicle, handed it in. And then the guy like, you know, basically did a trick where he kind of grabbed it and then became, you know, just kind of held the camera and then they could move with Ika on the car separately from that point on. It was crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Really, I, it's, that's pretty creative. You know? Yeah, and I, I'm looking. I said I've seen this film several times. I try, I try not to look because I don't, I don't ever really kind of want to look at the scenes of the movies once I see them. But even then, I still have really, I can't go. Oh yeah, that's a guy. I think it's because like, they have like an actual. He wants to put like a headrest on top of his head or something like that, and just I don't know. It's just they made it look pretty good. I didn't pick. I just was like, I don't know how that happened. 
Yeah. Um, there was stuff outside the cars while they were going that I have a rough idea of how they did it, but not really. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and certainly the fight scenes that were, or one he was in the fight and they were shooting overhead. I'm assuming they yeah. just lit off the car and shot that. Um, yeah. but it was amazingly well done. Um, just absolutely seamless. Yeah, to talk to yeah, because Rama is is basically at that point has kind of been subdued and is in the car with the bad guys with you know two in the front, two in the back, and he's in the middle in the back seat, and you know that all of a sudden this fight breaks out where he's having to just that's you know you know points for adding like a scene where it's like it's closer quarters than you could have imagined. Like you know he's still got to kind of navigate in that and to basically take out four guys you know by himself. Yeah, from I mean, from the setting position. Yeah, yeah. That's the other, there's several several of those punchline moments and and that's in that car chase scene, including like where he kicks a guy out of the halfway out of the car, the guy's head first bounces off the pavement. You're like, that's the first ouch, and all of a sudden he looks up and oh, there's this open car door, a parked car with an open door that just, you know, <laughs> you know, smacks them like real quick. It's like they just they just go from one thing to another. All of a sudden, you know, you're fighting inside the car and all of a sudden one guy's half outside the car and just, you know, gets obliterated. So it's they they just keep up the pace entirely. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's an interesting period because it's 2014 when this comes out. I haven't done the math to figure out. I guess I have IMDb open and I could figure it out. But like at this point, um, the only other thing I can think of that came anywhere remotely close to this was, uh, I guess it was about the same time. Yeah, same year. Uh, Winter Soldier um, mm-hmm. had the elevator fight and it had, you know, some stuff with, with fighting. Yeah within and and on cars and and all this stuff that they did. and of course it's more it's marvelized so you know steve i think winter soldier was one of the marvel ones where they kind of first it was most it was first noted that like oh hey this these fight scenes are kind of staged in a creative verse or interesting way versus like a, some of the other marvel kind of slugfest which are more of a cgi romp you know i think yeah. that's that was my recollection yeah yeah that that's true um it it was they tried to make it feel as possible, I think, as they could with when you have a dude who has jet wings and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and then giant floating, whatever, hover crafts with machine lasers on them and, you know, everything that they had. But yeah, I mean, but when Thousand they were, giant things exploding. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, as far as like up until that point, you know, a lot of the kinetic action. And so. One of the thoughts I wondered was, well, you know, was Avenger, were the guys watching this? And I, I think mm. that, frankly, the choreography is maybe marginally better in the Raid 2. Um, but especially when you think about the fact they weren't working with, you know, a $200 million budget. Um, and they were working under different circumstances. It's freaking mind-blowing. It's, it, 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 it rounds everything up, you know, by five. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a. I I still like that stuff in all the Marvel movies when they, especially when they do kind of the more gritty street level stuff, but the, this, in this movie was some of the, I mean, as much as I like the raid, um, I really, really dug what they were able to pull off here. Yeah. Yeah. That may, you may have answered then one of the questions I was going to ask you at the end, which is between the two films, you know, if, you know, if you had to choose which, you know. I think that to me, like I said, I've seen so many times. Like, I the selfish yeah. choice. I can't, I can't choose on it because they both offer something different, and I, you know, appreciate both of them. But I think, I think if I had to pick, I'd probably give Ray to a slight bit just for the the scope and the, what else they were the the way they were able to kind of improve on things in the general sense. Yeah, um, you know, it, they're just so totally different. They they work very yeah. well within the same world. I mean, you you have, um, you know, all the stuff the the very colorful characters the raid is able to say you know exactly who this guy is within two seconds of meeting him the the guy who's trying to find them when they're trapped in the crevice in the apartment and all that uh you know who that guy is (laughs) Uh, but like this one then (laughs) kind of turns it up a bit and says hey we we can kind of go nutty and brings in hammer girl and baseball batman oh man yeah um and I was like, you know, when you first see them at first, you're kind of like, I don't really, oh no. Oh, when, when she pulls <laughs> the hammers out of her big. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is some good Tarantino nods, I think, in there in certain places for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, those two light it up. I mean, and, and you know, it's uh, the they, you know, um, quick before we get to them, like the you know, uh, try to just jump back in time a, a second. The uh, uh, Precoso, you know, he gets he gets betrayed by Uko in that club that we talked about earlier, and then you know, which was a great fight as well. Like th- there was another time where uh, uh, the movie slows focus. I, I, that, you know, U- Uko and Prokos are talking in that club about like, how you know, things aren't like they used to be. You know, anyone can get in this club now, no one respects my father. And, you know, Prokos is like, Hey, just calm down young blood. Dude. We're, we're good. You know, don't worry about it. And then they toast and Uko kind of just says, Hey, I got to go take off for a minute. I'll be back. And at that moment, that's where Prokoso, um, just kind of like you know go back to like thinking about his family looking at the locket he has of his child and then you know the, the music's kind of bouncing and he's just, his eyes closed things slow down again so that kind of just that same visual thing that that gareth brought in with rama in a couple scenes previously and then you know to where all of a sudden it's cut the music's the music stops it's the club is empty you know he's obviously been ambushed and so that always led me to kind of wonder you know did he you know, was he drugged or does he just kind of lose himself in his thoughts or cause it's kind of, it was a weird, not, not, not weird, but it's, you know, a stylistic, you know, uh, surroundings cut to where it went from a, a whole lively club full of like hundred people to like just completely empty. And he's didn't, didn't even notice. Right. I think there were two options there for what, what, what happened. And I don't know which one I think it is. Um, I think one was, he just had kind of the interaction with the wife and he got so lost in his thoughts about his son. We don't really know how long hmm. passed. It didn't take long to clear the club, but he may not have noticed in the like four or five minutes it took for that to occur. Yeah. Um, maybe him looking at that locket is something he does whenever he has a, a down moment like that, especially if he's been drinking. But the other thing I think is possible is, this isn't his first rodeo and he knows what's about to happen. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. That's a good point. It's kind of, I guess I, I could tell something was up. I, yeah. I could, I could see that for sure. The, the funny thing about that fight is like, you know, it's again, it's, it's mad dog. It's, he's awesome. He's acrobatic. He's all over the place. And that, that club gives him so much to work with in terms of the different levels of like the VIP boost on the side and you know, all the guard, you know, safety rails, he can kind of whip around through and up and down. Um, <laughs> Props to all the stuntmen in that, like guys, one guy who got thrown off of that thing. He looks like he took a good, I don't know how they did that, if it was a visual trick, but he looked like he took a pretty good fall away. Mad Dog threw him off. But um, what I noticed about that, that fight was that he seems very in control of himself until the one point where one guy gets like a lucky, you know, kind of stab in on him. And then he kind of, and then he basically kind of, he almost loses it, goes after that one guy and kind of just like rails on him to you know, smash the bottle and just kind of goes after him hardcore while all these other guys are you know beating on him with bats stuff like that he doesn't even care anymore he's just like that one guy kind of drew the focus of his ire and i guess and that maybe that was his critically his undoing because that you know he eventually gets it i guess he dispatches everyone else but he kind of definitely took his hits because he staggers outside and that's where he uh, eventually meets up with uh you know i guess the guy who's called the assassin you know right. the, which I, I love his introduction um uh just because it's you know, it's you go from this, that dark club. You're talking to super dark and, and you know, uh, you know, just cloudy. And then he gets outside to this snowy night where it's like just white snow everywhere. And the, you know, assassin's kind of you know, he's he's no dummy. He's you know he he hasn't gotten as far as he has just from you know going in first. He lets all the other guys soften him up, and he just kind of stands there waiting. He's like, okay, I see this guy is basically you know kind of on his uh, on his, on the last rope. So he gets to walk over there with his little carom, but curved blades and, and uh, you know finish the job but uh i think that's you know it's, it's a, it was a good stoic introduction to that character who to basically set him up as like this is the number one bad or possible number one bad for rama to take on at the end of the film yeah uh, yeah they couldn't yeah. i mean you already know Assad is uh sorry that's the actor's name um uh Bejo, um is is not going to be that guy he's not going to be the he, he might be the yeah, big no. boss in some way but he's yeah he's the brains the brain, yeah yep yeah. um but yeah I, I did the only reason that scene bothered me is i was like has it ever snowed in indonesia like ever <laughs> yeah i couldn't answer that <laughs> i mean i'll take it stylistically but it was yeah 
Yeah, it was. If it, 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 I guess if you wanted to do the color palette thing, um, I mean, or white on red, yeah, or red on white, yeah, as it were, yeah, um, yeah. So it was, it was, it was a good stylistic scene. I don't ever want to be taken out of a movie wondering like, <laughs> wait, yeah, what are the weather patterns like? Here? Um, but anyway, it worked. It worked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just want. I sorry, I wanted to jump back there because I wanted to get to the introduction of the assassin because yeah i think he's just such a great character and, and just what he what he and rama do later on is so fantastic that you know yeah i wanted to get back to where he first came into the picture yeah and i was surprised how little they ended up actually using um hammer girl and baseball bat uh guy um, yeah uh as they were, it was cool stylistic stuff it did set it up for what was a good fight uh when rama enters the club um yeah but it at the same time i was like oh i thought kind of they would be the two whatever final things it makes sense yeah but they also can't have one huge fight right before he goes to fight the assassin yeah um so it just it sets it up to be a little bit odd yeah yeah that's true um yeah they, they, you know they i guess maybe if anything they were seen as like up and comers but still kind of raw like they're you know basically you can kind of see it in their they they both are given ample time in their own introductions to because they're they're used by Bejo to basically kind of like s- s- um, spark the gang war because I guess he was waiting you know he he basically kind of got Uko's more or less okay to yeah go ahead and you know uh, go send some of your people to go kill a bunch of the Japanese mafia's lieutenants or whatever and you know, you know let's try and let's let's try and whip up some anger between the two leaders that way um, so Bejo sends out you know, a hammer girl and bad boy to go kind of take out some, some people and the hammer girl gets like a whole subway full of knife wielding guys to take on. And, um, the actress that I, I read, she was not a trained martial artist, but I think she really acquitted herself well, you know, just, she seemed like she's pretty versatile in, in how she moved and, you know, just how she, <laughs> how she used all, you know, both those hammers to kind of just, you know, take those guys out. Um, yeah, it's, it, and it's this nice contrast because they, she just looks like an attractive young woman on subway. And then yeah. when you have that moment when the first hammer comes out and you're like, Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of this ends well. Yeah. For anybody, anybody except her. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and that was, yeah. It's kind of just, that, that had a nice little moment of uh, build up too, where, cause you know, basically there was a whole train car people who are now pan, you know, non-combatants who are panicked and leaving. And they just, she just kind of, you know, Stoically lets them all just kind of walk by her. It's like, hey, you're not part of what I'm interested in, so you guys can leave. Oh, you know, I've, I've got plenty of time. I'm happy to wait. You know, just kind of just ready to let the moment simmer a bit before, you know, any of the, the action and the violence breaks out. Yeah. Uh, with Bat Boy, you know, he's – I love the sound the sound fully work on that scene because he's just – you know, it just starts with him just dragging this metal battle on the concrete. He's just – you just you hear, the, hear the, 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 the crunch and the clang of the, the bat, and, like, you know, he, he gets to work pretty fast, including, like, I think, like – one ultra combo on the guy on the street where he just kind of just like, he just kind of, you know, hits him like I don't know, about six or seven times before the guy hits the ground. He just, just clank, 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 clank. And he just, yeah, you know, just, I don't know. This, those nice little moments where you're like, yeah, he kind of dispatches a couple people here and there real, real fast. But the other one guy he takes his time on just to kind of just, you know, preen uh, for the cameras more or less. Yeah. It, um, I, I did like the bit of him hitting people with the balls. Like that was, <laughs> That was inspired stuff. Yeah, that's it's a bit of, it, to me. It, it's a li- it's, it stretches a little into hyper reality, but like mm-hmm. I'm willing to go with it. I'm like, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's like I guess every action movie is hyper real to an extent, but they, you know, yeah, if he's he's definitely a super skill. If he can like you know, he's got <laughs> laser accuracy with that. <laughs> and he did he used to, he used it to good effect. It was it was it was definitely um, and it was it was a good element in the writing style. Like have the playful like you know, hey you know. Can you give me that ball back? You know, it's just sort of like, you know, just a, basically playing with your prey, so to speak. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it, that was part of why, I mean, I, I try and say on the podcast, like, look, if I was enjoying some something and there wasn't enough of it for me, that's not necessarily a problem. That just means they did something really well. And I wish I got to spend more time with those things. Yeah. Um, and and that's definitely how I felt about those two characters. Um, I, I would have been happy had there been, you know, they, but it's maybe it was the exact right amount because it, 
you know, you did have very realistic things going on in the film um, for it. And the, while the action is this hyper level, you also don't want it to slip into cartoonishness. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we kind of uh, going on, we, we talked about the car chase earlier, you know, uh, Ika, we're kind of moving towards the end of the film. Like he is at this point, Rama had gotten basically subdued uh, by the assassin in Bangun's office. Bangun's dead. Uko is now basically aligned with Bejo and Ika is, he got shot in the leg, but he made it out of the office, you know, he used cause he was, you know, kind of stumbled in upon Bangun after he'd been shot and was, you know, basically trying to stop things before Rama shows up. Um, Ika chases after Rama to try and rescue him. And Ika gets his own moments like uh, where he's as the as the rescuer trying to pursue the, the main car with Rama and he gets kind of waylaid by two other cars, some motorcycle guys. He just kind of fight them all off. He does some very, very impressive, you know, stunt driving to kind of just shake some guys off, disable some cars. Uh, and then you know, he gets that he gets the moment when the motorcycles show up where he basically, you know, he gets the one guy who uh, he hits the guy's motorcycle, the guy grabs on his car. And then it's, you know, another one of the punchline moments for Gareth Evans, where he's sitting there trying to push the guy off, push the guy off. The guy's hanging on, trying to, to get him. And then he could just pulls out the pistol and like gives him like a full, full magazine to the face. So it was basically like, you know, that was the, you know, ultra, you know, ultra, Oh my God moment, you know, of, of that particular scene for me. Um, I, w- that was one of them. The other one for me was when the um, car drives into the shack yeah side of the road like uh whoever with the stunt driver <laughs> was doing that deserved their pay that day that was rough yeah no yeah everybody put in put in their work for sure um plot wise we find that because uh you know he's he is also basically an undercover agent who's basically hung out to dry by bunawar and the rest like they basically kind of wrote him off and said that he had he had uh caused some some good cops get killed with bad, bad info that he gave. So he was sort of, you know, kind of just deserted, but you know, he doesn't feel that he was, he's like, I never, never changed. So it was kind of shades of what Rama, you know, could have been or what his fate could have been, I guess. Um, but that leads into Rama heading towards the the warehouse, right. You know, which is, you know, basically where Bejo is hanging out with Uko and, and Reza just trying to talk business. Uh, and Rama gets one more moment of kind of focus where he kind of calls Bunawar and says, Hey, is my family all right? You know, because he knows he's going into a situation that's, you know, just like all the others is just about as likely to, to kill him as not. And then he, that warehouse fight scene, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's overshadowed eventually by the baseball uh, bad boy and hammer girl fight and the assassin fight. But in between, it's like, that's still a great piece of like combination of, car work where he drives through the warehouse door and just immediately starts things into action versus all the guys he takes on the warehouse and all the, all the hard falls into do, man, there's the stonework guys were doing, they're doing overtime and like getting knocked off the top of a car or, you know, off of a, into a, a shelf and then off of a ledge. It's just, you know, they were, everyone was, uh, you know, taking extra ibuprofen that day. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really uh, conspicuously awesome set for them to fight on <laughs> yeah just, just a bunch of guys hanging out in a big old yeah the restaurant does a gigantic warehouse for a, where a restaurant ever it's just you know <laughs> sparsely populated but you know with enough tall shelves to pull over onto people yeah but i feel particularly bad for the uh there's like some old guy who was like in a in a bomber jacket that like rama like he's like the last guy up and the rama basically just like does like a 20 hit combo and him just sort of like knocks him down pulls him back in does other things and then just, you know, knocks him over the stair rail or whatever. And just like, you just, you know, come on around the stop. The guy's like getting a pension. <laughs> there was once, there was one guy though. I didn't buy in that scene. He, Rama picks up an empty water bottle and throws it at him. <laughs> yeah. And, because he's just, he's in the middle of like pulling stuff off the shelves and it's clearly an empty water bottle. And mm-hmm. He gets hit and he still does the like, oh, like an arm wave. <laughs> He's been hit, you know, in the face by something. Uh, He'd already seen what they, what Rama Dental, the first eight guys. He's like, ah, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sit this one out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't have to be, no- I don't actually have to be knocked out. I can just pretend to be knocked out. That's. I'll good. just lay oh, here until he yeah, leaves. Yeah. 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 I'll say I did my best. Um, but, but yeah. yeah, have you have you ever seen the cook, the thief, his wife, in her longer? You know, I I don't think so. Could not ask like, for two more different movies. They, they they have 
literally nothing in common except for that movie takes place entirely within a restaurant and and it's every room is completely different like the the dining room the bathrooms the it doesn't take place entirely within a restaurant but mostly um no. and so colors heavily used and so i'd already kind of thought about the the color stuff a little bit uh from some of the other things we talked about but once they entered in here there's also like this back room you enter you can enter basically the prep area of of that restaurant and so there was some of that here of like that area is gray then they get into the kitchen uh the actual literal kitchen and i mean one hats off to that crew having the perfect timing of like what's going on beat 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 yeah. Everyone go. <laughs> yeah, exit. <laughs> they must have been under strict orders to like to get that meal prepared because prior to that, like you know, Ron was fighting Hammer Hammer Girl and baseball that were right outside. So and unless the kitchen has really good soundproofing, they knew something was not going well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh the the colors in in Beja's restaurant are are pretty wild. But the um that, oh, that when he right. runs into the assassin is in the kitchen. Oh yeah, um, I, was, I, was, I was curious. You know, the uh, thief wife cooking this lover. Like, the, is that was that also by the same guy that did like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer? I remember like there's it was some movies around that era where like they were rated X for not sexual content or something else. Was that- no, it uh, was by Peter Greenaway uh, who did like a lot of art film sort of things uh, like Prospero's books and things like that. Um, it's it's Helen Mirren and really early Tim Roth. Um, oh, wow. And it's it's about a like mob boss who buys a restaurant and he's just an absolute monster and Helen Mirren's his wife and um she falls for a writer who's eating by himself in the same restaurant um and they're kind of it's it's very play like um it's 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 it's, and the artifice of all of it is is part of the story but um it's i think it's on peacock or something no it's on brickbox right now um it was on peacock which freaking blew my mind when we got peacock and that <laughs> popped up and i was like I, I just wanted to watch amber ruffin um <laughs> but it uh it's it's it was a accidental watch when i was at ut as a student of like oh helen mirren's on the poster in like her underwear sure i'll go see this <laughs> yeah thing. Why not? it was this really intense movie which i i recommend like to keep. okay the, yeah not for everybody. All right, I'll put that put that on my list for sure. Oh, uh, right, again, so not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're, bar- we're barely towards the end. Like you know, uh, we get that big splash of red with uh, uh, the L shaped hallway that uh, Rama fights Hammer Girl and Bat Boy in, um, which is preceded by a little kind of comical thing of them being like, you know, uh, Bejo kind of tells them to go check things out, and that's where they kind of, and you know. That boy grabs Hammer Girl from the restaurant where there's a bar where they're sitting, and she's like kind of comically grabs after her hammers. It's almost kind of like playful in a way, which is, you know, understated. But uh, yeah, that, that fight that they have with Ram is like, it's not very long, but like it's, I mean, it's still intense. And like, you know, I think mm-hmm. it's, um, I mean, just the kind of the way they work together and communicate. But, and, you know, that's, that might be that, that fight might have the biggest, you know, kind of punchline exclamation point moment where he, you know, Rama gets the, gets the drop on, on Bad Boy. Um, kind of stuns him with that that kick, rolls away, and then just kind of turns the bat back on him. But that's that always gets like a real big rise from the crowd when I do the watch parties because it's just like first you get the shock of like oh the bat actually you know you actually see that bat go two into his face, and then it was like the the medium shot cutaway where Ramos is kind of standing there, the bat still kind of in the guys, <laughs> the guys holding the the bat with his face kind of thing. Yeah, um, t- tastefully far enough away where it's not you know graphic, but it's like you know definitely sells the the impact i guess yeah so to speak <laughs> yeah so this is you know, those moments where you just kind of finish fighting like whew, okay catch your breath but then like they did then the film doesn't give you any time because it leads you directly no no i don't think no steps in between straight into the the one-on-one with the assassin yeah which is like 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 you noticed the, or like you like you had said that 
perfectly set stage for that with like it's you know it's a white kitchen just like the you know just as white as the snow that was outside when Procoso got killed and uh you know there's you know i i can't um can't say enough good things about that this fight scene because uh uh you know just how how much personality the assassin is able to kind of exhibit with not a whole lot of time where you're like you know, he's basically kind of been stoic the whole time before but then when you kind of like you know sees rama and they sort of like go to stand next show you go you know okay this is the big showdown and like you know they kind of do this kind of cool little foot shuffle thing where they kind of get real close to each other and you, they kind of have this you can totally have this understanding of like we're not really going to go full out right yet we're going to like just test we're going to spar and the assassin kind of knows like oh i've got a real kind of challenge here he's still confident he's like uh, you know I've, i'm going to take this guy out because i because i knocked him out you know 20 minutes ago in the film so i'm pretty sure i can take him but they you know he's got this very mischievous little smile on his face whenever you kind of like they do like a little couple of quick little you know swats and blocks and kind of pause you know the music's kind of like pensive and sort of just you know not really sure where things going they do like three like about three of those kind of sparring things and then after that sort of like you know then it rocks off into the full fight but you know all that time that guy's got this little kind of grin on his face like oh okay yeah i see you're pretty sharp you got fast feet you know this is gonna be fun kind of thing like he's assassin definitely feels like he is He's selling the an image of like you know okay yeah this is this is pretty entertaining I'll I'll have fun with this kind of thing yeah. yeah yeah you definitely get the feeling he he does not face actual challenges all that often so probably having uh you know a very weakened uh Picoso and then getting Rama in in the same week was probably like Christmas <laughs> right um, yeah. But then Rama proceeds to basically kind of like just tee him up almost entirely in the first part. It's great. The whole scene is like a tale of two fights, right? Where it's, you know, essentially it's um, assassin quickly understands that Rama is not the, you know, easy mark that he was and seemed to be in Ben Gwen's office. Uh, you know, Rama's basically owning that fight. just kind of just hit him with combos, smashing bottles on his head, just doing all sorts of stuff, you know, smashed him through the wine, uh, the wine uh, room, a glass room and then finally assassin has enough and says okay well all right now i'm a little bit worried so out come the curved knives and then you know you know takes a little swipe at, at uh rama and then things you know really get really really get going and that's where to me like this thing mean, uh, uh i'm pretty much on the edge of my seat at that point because the music just kind of gets going in a really thrilling way uh the music i didn't really mention at this point it was you know in the last film it was um Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park and then this Joe Trapanese who kind of worked together on the film. And, you know, this film definitely has with Mike Shinoda, not there, Joe Trapanese continued on. I'm not sure, I'm sure he worked with somebody else or not, but it definitely, it's still to me is great music and it, it's every bit matches the moment, but like it just, it, you know, it, it, uh, it doesn't have that, that kind of Lincoln Park adjacent sound that, that Mike had from the first one. I love both soundtracks, but the, or both, both scores, but the, the, final song or final uh, track that goes along with this scene. It just like, it just keeps building and building and building as they, you know, kind of go through this desperate knife fight, you know, which starts with Rama trying to, you know, he's basically facing, you know, zero knives against the assassins too. And he's like trying to, you know, find any kind of edge he can, he can, uh, you can get, I don't know. I've ever thought you had on the, on that particular sequence. Yeah, no, I thought it was, it was, um, you know, I, I did watch with my wife who then was like, why didn't this guy pull out, you know, his knives at the beginning? And I'm just like, because, because <laughs> why he's not that guy. He doesn't pull mm -hmm. out the knives until he realizes maybe this isn't going his way. He's very used to things going his way. He doesn't need yeah. knives 99% of the time. Um, He's, he's, you know, and so she, she, she bought whatever my line of thinking was on it. But, um, I mean, you do have the, the issue of there's not that much blood in the human body, but, uh, correct. Yeah. Hyper reality <laughs> wins again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it works. I think it's, it's, uh, the choreography of it is fantastic. Um, they managed to do when they are cutting, um, you don't go, oh, well, you'd never come back from that. Like it, it, it feels like, okay, as motivated as both of these guys are now, I'm not sure Rama 20 minutes later is going to be feeling very well, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Once, once the adrenaline wears off. Yeah. But it, it does feel somewhat feasible, but I mean, but just the choreography of it and, and using the set the way they did uh, and using that space and it it was very 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 well shot and it's one of those things too that's kind of fun of like you do see the 
I, I'm going to use word wine cellar because I don't have another word for it. Yeah. Um, the, this glassed in room they have where they keep all the wine and you're like, all right, I know that that glass is yeah. not gonna stay <laughs> for five minutes. Yeah, it, it's coming down. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, but that that but the whole the final final part of that scene where he's he's basically just it's this kind of just constant tripwire attention of like you know first objective is get at least one of those knives away from the guy which he you know eventually after a lot of dodging and scrambling gets one away and then now all of a sudden they're on even terms um, you know and finally started to trade a little bit of shots with you know getting little cuts in here and there there's like I said there's great use of the of this the equipment or like you know like the big you know uh, all the metal shelving and drawers they have there, they're, they're getting their heads banged off of that. The sound fully work is great. of them just kind of just you hear these big, you know, crash metallic crashes of just them getting slammed and all the like holds and locks and, you know, spins and escapes that they're doing are fantastic. Uh, there's one point where, which also gets all always gets an, an appreciative kind of woo from the crowd is when like uh, the assassin sort of like, he kind of goes after Ram is having like about a four shot of like weaving shots and Ram just kind of, he's doing like some Muhammad Ali level sort of just, you know, head bobbing and, and weaving, which is just looks really sharp. And the, the way they shot it, uh, you know, just kind of just the quickness and agility that's required, but yeah, you're right. By the end of it, it's, it's like a, a Pollock painting of, of blood with them. Just kind of just the, by the end of it, they just kind of get in close and they're just trading shots with those knives. And, you know, yeah, it's, it seems like as much as, you know, Rama won, they both kind of lost a lot out of that. Um, but it's pretty much like just peak adrenaline on that, right? Until to the point where you know he gets the final final shot in on uh, on the assassin, and then it's like it's almost like a, a weirdly intimate moment because he basically kind of like gets a, gets the shot in, kind of just basically you know uh, takes the guy's throat out, I guess, with the knife, and then pulls him back, and the guy's you know still kind of breathing, laying on Rama's shoulder, and they're both kind of just like completely just spent, like it just there's nothing left. Though that was like the last thing each swing either one's going to make and then like you know it's just sort of like you know i don't know they definitely don't like each other but i guess they could at least maybe in, in death respect each other i don't know yeah it's a it's very different from the mad dog fight in the other film um yeah of it, it it's as life or death as that fight but um mad dog has only an inkling of respect for anybody else in that movie. And, and this guy's like, okay, you know, I, I, he just sees him very, very differently. So it's, mm-hmm. it's all of which is communicated, as you said, you know, mostly non-verbally and, and uh, pretty elegantly. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, the movie's pretty much as far as actually, I guess, well, not as far as the hand hand fights go, the movie's over at that point, but like, you know, we still have the final resolution with Uko and, and, uh, and Bejo. And that's, you know, uh, and Reza too, who kind of gets his, you know, karmic uh, justice. Um, Uko having kind of, well, it's actually not like he really figured out what's going on. He actually found this wire that Rama planted earlier and made the mistaken conclusion that Bejo, he basically, he basically came to the right conclusion by the wrong, you know, means, I guess, you know, that, that Bejo is basically kind of like, you know, not on his side, more or less. Um, so Uko kind of ch- takes charge by a shotgun of the scene and, you know, takes out Reza, takes out Bejo. And that's, you know, that's probably the last big, you know, punch. that's that's a punchline moment where the punchline is actually that didn't pull away because he t- he basically kind of like wounds Bejo, gets him on the ground, and then Space is standing over him with the shotgun. And, like, that's the, that's the point where you go, oh, okay, they're going to, He's going to shoot and this cut this scene's going to pull away, but then it's like, no, it just kind of doesn't, does it in a long medium shot. So it's not like up super close, but that's definitely a, a, a shocker of the scene is, you know, that the, the final, you know, final, final uh, you know, silencing of Bejo, so to speak. Yeah. And again, um, it's the three, it's the cops and the two guys, uh, and, and no one can, no one really knows what any, you know, they, they've all kind of turned on each other, kind of like at the beginning of the film. And, yeah, um, I mean, Ram is there for the last part of it because he and Uko have kind of the perfunctory, you know, fate face off. Um, but it's not even really worth mentioning. It's like he shoots at him a bunch and yeah, then he so. wins and, um there's there's some the the film kind of wraps with like you never i'm not sure if they're setting up for another sequel or what the what the plan was but you don't see rama 
you know, get back. You don't have the scene of him coming back to the family with bandages all over him or them finding mm-hmm. him in the hospital. All yeah. you see is the Japanese have been tipped off to the fact that they think there's a collaboration going on between Reza and they, there was between Bejo, Raza and Uko. So they're going to just wipe everybody out and start over. Um, and they show up and there's this, everyone's literally still rolling around in the warehouse <laughs> on the floor in pain. Cause it's only been like 10 minutes or something. Yeah. And uh, Rama's making his way back out. And he, so they see this guy kind of walking through all the broken bodies. And um, but then the sound is not there. It's it's mm-hmm. all like. Uh, it's I a piano remember. score. They which did yeah, I, or What did they do there? I don't remember. It's well, yeah, they, the uh, I mean, after yeah, after Uko's killed. Yeah, it's, it starts in this uh, kind of just very plaintive, you know, very simple but kind of to me haunting piano scores it's very kind of like it is that kind of breath after all you basically been holding in this breath your the entire movie and all of a sudden you like rama get to kind of let out like oh okay geez it's it's all over really it's you know really sinking in it's all over and it's just kind of just kind of mournful kind of slightly sad tune which i it was recently when i was working with my my younger son who plays some piano he was asking for a new song to play. I was like, oh, well, you know, this is kind of cool, relatively simple song from the end of the raid, too. And, and we looked it up. It's actually a, a Nine Inch Nails song. I didn't even know that. Oh. Off, off an album I never heard. Yeah, it's like mm. like uh, 13 Ghosts version okay. two or something. But uh, I was like, oh, okay. But yeah, it's just, and it's, you know, it, it, to me, it's a, it, it kind of just kind of hits me emotionally. I, you know, just from, because of all, everything that's come before in that movie, and all of a sudden you got this very, very melodic, very beautiful song playing over this, you know, and it's just sort of shots of like, like I said, empty shots of like all the, all the aftermath and the different rooms, the kitchen or the restaurant and the warehouse. And, and uh, you're, you're, you're right. There's, there's no, no audio, no dialogue or, or you can't hear it, but he's Rama's sitting there. He's all of a sudden, he's totally exhausted walking out and he sees all of a sudden, here's another fresh, you know, army of bodies of all these Japanese guys who were you know, ready to do who, do who knows what. And they have this dialogue that you can't, that you can't uh, hear, you know, just back and forth. And it's, uh, it's the Japanese kind of consigliere who's kind of a, he's, you've seen him a couple of times in the movie. He doesn't say much or doesn't get a whole lot of acting, but he's kind of, seems like he seems like a kind of a wise, wry kind of person. <laughs> and he's like asking questions of Rama and Rama's replying. And, and then uh, you don't get to hear the guy's last question, but then Rama just, you know, replies with, you know, no, I'm done. And then that's cut in the movie, which to me is, that's perfect. Like, you know, there was, I couldn't ask for a better cap to, I think Rama's arc and just, you know, to between those two films was like a complete series for him. Uh, there was talk at some point of there being a raid three, but just kind of never materialized. And I think Gareth had said that if they had done one, it would have been, it might not even have involved Rama at all. It would have kind of like, you know, you know, segue off into some other aspect of like the Jakarta and underworld or something like that. So, I mean, I, I'm as much as I, I wouldn't want to say it, I'm glad there's no raid three. I, I'm happy that these two raid films kind of make that full story for me in terms of that and how they ended. It was very, felt very poignant. Like, and like you said, they never, they never show where he goes after that, but you can, you can hope or assume that he basically kind of gets let go and, you know, gets back to his family and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't feel like it was, I need a sequel or that they needed to show those connections at the end. Um, It it made sense because the story is really about him extracting himself from all of that. And I don't feel like it's like some Sopranos thing where it's like ambiguous at the end and you don't know what, what's happening to him. The Japanese guys are going to let him go. Like they don't, they don't need him. They know what happened. Uh, Yeah. He's not There's nothing in it for him. Those guys. So, um, anyway, I, I, I it, it was an absolute blast to watch. Um, I'm not shocked that you've programmed it for your uh, office watch parties. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, it, it's really easy to see here. Like the raid, I think I had to pay to see. This was just on Netflix. Mm, okay. um, so if, if folks are looking for it, it's um, you don't have to have seen the first raid. Um, I would recommend it They're They go hand in hand very, very well. 
Um, but uh, it, it's also a good standalone crime. And if you like, you know, basic crime gangster movies, this one's that plus um, and in a really cool way. So I, yeah. I would definitely recommend this one. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm still waiting for the uh, 4K remasters of them. I, I don't know if that'll ever happen based on you know how much money they made, but you know it's a I feel like they're they deserve it. But yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I'll start my own petition or something. I have a Google Digest you know news alert set for 4K raid, but it usually just turns up like oh you know cops seize 4K pounds of you know marijuana in raid. I'm like no, that's not the news I want. <laughs> I want, I'll, t- I want to tell you what man if i see it pop yeah. up anywhere i'll let you know immediately <laughs> i appreciate that that's fantastic yeah. oh yeah it's uh it i mean it, it, sooner or later everything will get um upscaled um especially stuff that was shot from this era um but yeah it's uh because they, they don't have to go through and scan it you know frame by frame like they do with actual film um so i I would i i I would i would hold that hope just recently um i had believed it was possible i'd never see heroic trio again um and that just showed up on criterion like looking fresh as a new dollar bill uh um, so yeah it's not it's not released as a disc yet but it is there and like they're doing theatrical releases of it right now they just played it at the alamo here so um very different movies different you know nations all that but um i guess my message is never give up hope because i honestly thought i'd never see hero (laughs) trio again and it's now out there good i'll uh, I'll keep the faith (laughs) any any final thoughts on this any any other uh things you want Um, no it seems like uh, i mean you know i think like uh but a question for you, like I could ask, it's like, is there anything from the movie that if you had your time um, behind the camera and edit bay, you would change? Like for me personally, like you know, the one thing that I would that I would have pulled back is something that I think I kind of talked about at another point of the first film, which is you know we you mentioned that Gareth Evans, you know, we his whole thing is he, he can kind of do this high high stakes high octane action, but then when when there's the he doesn't linger on it like a horror movie would, but yeah. I feel like for inexplicable reasons, he did that once in each of the two movies. Uh, in this movie, it's the scene where he, we didn't really talk about it during the discussion, but Rama gets ambushed by some corrupt cops and he goes, he basically fights his way into a restaurant. Right. And then the end of that scene is him. Like uh, he basically kind of holds this guy's face down to the grill. And like in, in way longer than I would think that anyone would need to, or think to. And I, and you know, it's, and it's, it's just, you even see the guy afterwards, he's all, kind of burned up and nasty and just like, you know, um, if I had, if I was an editor, I would yeah, basically kind of cut that out or cut it back or something uh, just because I feel like it's, it's just, it was that one step over for me personally. Like everyone's got that line and that's, you know, yeah. I think you and I are kind of on the similar, similar levels where I was like, that's just too much. I, you know, the only thing I could think that was in there for was that, that, uh, you know, it was maybe trying to sell, Oh, maybe Rama has gone too far into his character and he's, you know, gotten too intense or something. But I mean, but it, it's, didn't quite work for me other than that mean but i don't know if there's some other thematic or you know elements that i think i think i would have looked for a little more clarity in um in this may have been a translation thing um of what bejo want physically wanted not like Mm -hmm. clearly he wants power clearly he wants you know, to be top of the heap. He's, he's, you know, willing to power all that. It was, they left out, I think a few beats of, and if we do this, then this yeah. will happen. And then this will happen. And then we'll have our end goal. And instead it was kind of like, I just want, I, I somehow, if there's a gang war, then I'll have this land. And it was like, yeah. will you uh, land question marks profit yeah right and and i understood if he had the land he had plans for it that's cool that's you know very long good friday i get it um but it uh it it i thought that there were a few things there that could have gotten a little more tightened up uh as far as what i understood his motivations i needed to get the super details of the motivation and i think that was like one sentence away from happening hmm. um I, I, as far as the action and all that goes, 
it it did because and i probably wouldn't have thought about it much if we hadn't talked about it so much with the first raid movie of kind of them cutting away um there were a few moments where i was kind of like oh they actually showed that this time um and i and so i it didn't slow me down but i it did make me go oh that's what they did with the budget this time is they actually showed that <laughs> uh, they must have made a mold of batman's head and and so they could squish it right um, <laughs> So yeah, that, wanted to play with. Yeah, um, so it was just interesting stuff like that. But um, okay, no, that's fair. Yeah, completely. And I, it, I think, go ahead. I was gonna say if you if uh, the only other thing I a question I had asked you to pick your brain is um, the thought about how the fact that both these movies were made for a pretty relatively meager amount of money, about a million dollars and four million dollars respectively. But like, <clears throat> my question is. Uh, Theoretically, do you think like if those these movies actually had significant marketing or a studio push where they had you know a a, a bigger presence that they would have been big hits in the, in that area of the mid 2010s or is it or is this style of action kind of like too niche or you know like the, the subtitles or the lack of name recognition? I'm just I'm just kind of curious if if these were always kind of destined to be you know sort of under the radars you know like, like, no, like no amount of marketing would have made these things. Um, mainstream mainstream hits i don't know what i mean the, 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 this is a whole separate podcast but <laughs> the i mean the getting theatrical distribution the past 15 20 years is significantly different from what it was when we were in college and kind of the go-go 90s um of you know Tarantino definitely took a stab and did some distribution of films from, you know, other countries you had, it's not an art house film necessarily, but like, I remember in college, the village would show stuff occasionally that surprised me a little bit. That was a little more actiony. Um, I think like, I'm a little surprised the Alamo as a chain didn't try and like pick it up and do its own distribution of these films, uh, which tells me something was probably already tied up with them somehow um but like look uh it, it's it's a unpleasant fact that um hollywood has not been great about asians and pacific islanders ever mm-hmm. like it the, the there was a reason tears were shed when everything everywhere all at once won the oscar right yeah. um it's 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 a very long and very and that can be a whole separate podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 not been a great history, even from the movies you and I grew up with that were produced at the time. Um, occasionally, something would get brought over. Uh, you know, whether it was martial arts or something like Raise High the Red Lantern or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, it, even like Akira Kurosawa movies and stuff had a hard time. So t- taking. Now you're not even talking about like we basically think we kind of get Japan in its way uh, or China, but we now it's Indonesia and and like we really don't know what to make of this. Um, now that said, I don't know how any studio exec or distribution exec watched these and didn't immediately go, oh, we can make a shit ton of money with these if we market it to like twelve year olds and up. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I literally don't know because that, that was the kind of stuff you used to walk into the VHS place and see. And that's the VH, the whole home video market was dead by the time you hit, you know, the 2010s. And so I think it just the the era of, hey, what's this? You know, as you would do over the shelf to your buddies uh-huh. or brother or whatever at Blockbuster yeah. or more likely the mom and pop shop or gas station you were renting movies at. Uh, where you would find stuff that was a little off the beaten path. Um, yeah. The best you can get now is a, you know, uh, algorithm out of Netflix or whatever. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, you know, like I, I had this, when this movie came out, like that was, you know, I, I, I'd, again, I, my friend, Kevin from Dawson, he'd already kind of shown me the first one. And so when I, we got news that this was coming out and actually was out in Austin. And I think we, I made a special trip up to Austin to see it with, with him and my other friend, uh, at the one of the Alamos there, and like, but even then, you know, I, 
And I, I think I'd heard about it in Houston too. So I knew it was, there must have been some marketing for it, but just not much. And then, you know, when we saw it, it must have been the first weekend and we were in there with like four or five other people, I guess. So, you know, it was, it wasn't, people weren't knocking down the doors to go see it, at least from the, our impression of the, the, the viewing that we saw. But, you know, I was still super happy to see it on the big screen. I was just, you know, that I'll always kind of uh, cherish it and be able to, you know, say, okay, it did get up there. I, I did see it in a super huge uh, auditorium sure. at least once. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also the the very real thing that the only rated R stuff that that people tend to show up for in theaters these days is horror. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not horror. It's not English speaking. Um, they probably didn't want to dub it. So, you know, because people you have those waging, you know, those battles of people. I, how dare you dub that movie? It always yeah. happens. To theater, right. <laughs> right. Um, and so. It just had a lot going against it. It's just, easy, just easier to not in some ways. Just yeah. like, let's not mess with it. But it's interesting to hear it did get some Alamo distribution because that sounds right for that era. Like, I, I remember a few movies coming out um, to the Alamo then that even the Alamo now was so corporatized. It, I don't really think a shot. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Someone know, Starbucks is running rush. the Alamo now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. Yeah, Very there, was, there was a shift. I'm, I'm removed. We only have one in Houston. That's way far away from me. So I never, never go to yeah. it. I mean, she took over just like when COVID hit. Um, but b- even before then there's there in the different Alamos around town show different things. Like the one downtown you could, you, and you never knew what was going to be downtown. It was awesome. That's uh, where we saw drive. My wife and I, I was I enjoyed that. You saw which one there? Uh, drive. We saw uh, it yeah, uh, down right. downtown. As did as did I. As did I. Yeah, it's great. Um, but it uh, the the one that's down by me. I live kind of near Circle C. Um, it's that one just shows you know whatever the mainstream movies are because it's the Circle C crowd turning up. Okay. Uh, yeah, so going local demographics. Movies. Yeah. Yeah, occasionally they'll be like, it's a Wednesday. We're going to show an old James Bond movie or something like that. But it's like, I'm not going. It's a work night. Like, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's kind of not, it's not what it was, uh, in the, the days when we were, you know, I don't know if you ever went to the Colorado Street location, but, um, yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's where my, my friend Kevin and I actually saw, Amelie together when we thought we were going to see Dominic Darko, but he got the the movie movie date, dates wrong. <laughs> so it's just just he had just just a guy a guy's friend date to see Amelie together. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I went to go see at the Paramount Summer Classic Series. I went to go see Giant. I was already I was like this movie is like three and a half hours long. I know it's a button numathon. I am totally ready. And I accidentally had shown up on the wrong weekend and it was a Bruce Dern movie called Black Sunday about mm-hmm. a guy trying to kill a bunch of people at the Super Bowl. Oh, um, man, it's fun. And I, for, for the first five minutes, I was like, what is happening? Because it was a movie that wasn't <laughs> going to show its titles till they'd already had a couple of scenes. OK. And I was just like, this is not giant. I don't am I Am I dreaming? What's happening? <laughs> and I was by myself. That's fantastic. Oh, uh, Anyway, uh, well, thank you so much for, for bringing The Raid and Raid 2 to me. I'm glad to have finally seen them, uh, and I highly recommend them to everyone else. This is the kind of action stuff that gets me super jazzed these days. Um, so go out and check them out. Do you have Do you have any idea what you want to do next, Mike? Um, no, I mean, you know, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the next one. I mean, you know, anything from, like, similar style like no country for old men so we can you know tackle a you know a comedy i'm i'm game for anything there's lots of great movies out there to talk about that you know i don't think you've covered yet so just uh really happy to be part of the discussion that you know thanks for the opportunity oh man no thank you thank you so much uh deeply appreciate it and thank you to all the listeners out there as long as we're thanking people uh do go out there and tell your friends about the raid and tell them about the podcast and mike why not tell them about Mike <laughs> as long as you're telling them about things? Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not on any social media, but just tell them Mike's here. Mike, Mike exists and he likes yeah, it. Yeah, I do. I do exist. <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much. And I will, uh, we'll, we'll do it again soon. All right. Thanks. All right, thanks.
that about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to drop on by The Signal Watch blog, where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. We'd love to hear from you, so find us online and let us know what you think. Whether you prefer email, blog comments, or social media, we'll be happy to hear from you. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind. <laughs>